But we begin tonight with the next phase of the historic first criminal trial of a former U.S. president. That is because the defense in Donald Trump's hush money election interference trial rested its case today. And counter to Trump's many claims, they rested without hearing a word from him on the witness stand. Closing arguments are scheduled to begin one week from today. And before the jury begins its deliberations, the judge will provide the jury with their instructions that outline what verdict jurors should deliver based on what they determined to be true through the evidence that was presented. Each word in those jury instructions is critical to whether Trump is found guilty or not guilty by the jury. This afternoon, Judge Juan Marchand heard from both prosecution and the defense as they argued about what language should be used to instruct the jury on the law. Of course, it is ultimately Marchand's decision what those final instructions will be. As for the 12-member jury, they left today following the defense's lone material witness, who may have been the worst defense witness possible, second to Trump himself. Robert Costello, the criminal lawyer with ties to Rudy Giuliani, who was trying to get Michael Cohen to hire him in 2018, as Cohen was facing federal indictment connected to this case, was back on the witness stand for a second day, trying to undercut Cohen's testimony. Instead, he wound up undercutting his own credibility, as prosecutor Susan Hoffinger used his own emails against him where he disparaged Cohen and showed that he was really working for Trump and not Cohen. In an email to his partner, Jeff Citron, Costello wrote, our issue is to get Cohen on the right pa page without giving him the appearance that we are following instructions from Giuliani or the president. In my opinion, this is the clear, correct strategy. In another email to Citron, Costello wrote, tune in to CNN and see how they are playing this up. Cohen has to know this, yet he continues to slow play us and the president. Is he totally nuts? What should I say to this a-hole? He is playing with the most powerful man on the planet. Perhaps the biggest surprise today is that the defense rested its case without even attempting to raise a defense about the actual case against Trump. All they seemed to do was attack Cohen, his credibility and his motives. Now, to be clear, a defendant is not obligated to make a case in a criminal trial. But in this case, Trump's defense team made a promise to the jury. During his opening statement, Trump defense attorney Todd Blanche made the claim that the jury would learn that the money Trump paid to Cohen in 2017 was not a payback, especially not a reimbursement for the money Cohen paid to Stormy Daniels. It was all just a retainer agreement because Cohen was Trump's personal attorney. And yet, the prosecution laid out three key pieces of documentary evidence that the defense failed to bring up, let alone counter at any time. There was the handwritten notes by Alan Weisselberg on the First Republic bank account statement showing the $130,000 wire transfer to Stormy Daniels' lawyer that notes the breakdown of the repayment plan to Cohen, including grossing up the amount to cover any tax liabilities and adding a bonus which amounted to a total of $420,000. Then there was Trump's signed 2017 presidential public financial disclosure report that under the part marked liabilities included the line, in the interest of transparency, while not required to be disclosed, in 2016, expenses were incurred by one of Donald J. Trump's attorneys, Michael Cohen. Mr. Cohen sought reimbursement of those expenses, and Mr. Trump fully reimbursed Mr. Cohen in 2017. The category of value would be $100,001 to $250,000. And if that's not enough, there was also Trump's own tweet from May 3rd, 2018. Yes, there is always a tweet where Trump admitted that the monthly payments were a reimbursement for Stormy Daniels' non-disclosure agreement. So no matter how much the defense will likely focus on Cohen and his credibility in their closing argument next week, they have no way to attack the credibility of the documentary evidence already presented to the jury that makes the case against Trump. Joining me now is Katie Fang, trial attorney and host of The Katie Fang Show on MSNBC, Danny Savalos, criminal defense attorney and MSNBC legal analyst, and Tristan Snell, former assistant attorney general from New York and author of Taking Down Trump, 12 Rules, for prosecuting Trump by someone who did it 
successfully. Thank you all for being here. Katie, my sister, I have to start with you um, because I know you've been in court every day. I actually saw you in court the day that I was got to be there and saw how diligently you are taking notes and paying attention. Throughout this case, have you heard any day, because maybe I've missed it in the, in the, the Google Docs and transcripts and stuff that y'all have been sending me, was there any time at which the defense countered any of those three pieces of seemingly really, really important evidence that I just discussed? No, and that's a really important distinction for you to raise, Joy, because as my esteemed colleagues on this panel know, the questions that are posed during cross-examination by the lawyers is not evidence. It's the answers that are elicited from the witness from the witness stand that ends up being the evidence. And so when you consider the attempts to cross-examine people like David Pecker, all the way to Michael Cohen with, you know, a little bit of a detour through Stormy Daniels along the way, what testimony that was elicited from those witnesses, especially when they disagreed with the characterizations that were provided by Trump's counsel, that testimony from those witnesses is the evidence. And so when provided with the opportunity, and by the way, it's not like Judge Bershon told Trump that he only had a couple of days or a yeah. little bit of time to be able to put on a defense. What did we hear? We heard from a paralegal from Todd Blanche's law firm who said that actually he helped the prosecution and said that the 75 phone calls that the defense made it sound like was between Michael Cohen and with Robert Costello were actually not a total of 75 and that there were dupes that were included in there. But more importantly, you heard from Robert Costello. And so you would think at some point in time, someone on behalf of the defense would get up and explain not only what you just put up as the graphics, right, at the beginning of this segment, but what about that meeting in Donald Trump's office at Trump Tower after Michael Cohen met with Alan Weisselberg with that account statement from Essential Consultants LLC, where Donald Trump approved it verbally and signed off on the fact that Trump would then pay Cohen $420,000 for $130,000. We didn't hear anything about that. And so Trump had a lot of opportunity to be able to take down the credibility even more so of people like Michael Cohen, and he failed to do so. And so, of course, the jurors, as you noted, they're gone for seven days, Joy. Yeah. They recess today. They don't come back till Tuesday morning at 930. And as Tristan and as Danny knows, that's a long time for them to sit and think about the last thing that they heard. And the yes. last thing they heard was bad stuff from Robert Costello. Right. And the thing is, Danny, you know, as a former defense attorney, I mean, here's the problem. They don't have to put on defense. They're not required. The, the, the obligation is on the prosecutor to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Donald Trump committed a crime. But the defense, to Katie's point, they left the jury with the guy who pissed off the judge. You know, I've been a, a grand juror. I mean, I, I, I haven't sat in a jury. I was dismissed when I've, <laughs> and the last time they tried to call me for jury service, they were like, yeah, you get out. Um, but I imagine that the judge is probably the most popular person in the room. And so if you're making the judge mad, I'm not sure you're very popular with the jury, whereas Michael Cohen was a calm witness who went methodically through, and the prosecutors seem to be quite brilliant, and they're good and succinct. What sense did it make to leave the jury with that bad taste in their mouth today? What did it accomplish? It might have accomplished just satisfying the client if you're mm -hmm. defense counsel, you because go. I expect in a couple years yeah. we'll find yeah. out yeah. that Donald Trump really pushed to have Robert <clears throat> Costello on the stand and that Costello himself really wanted to be on the stand. And frankly, when you're defense counsel, you're at the end of a trial, you're punchy, it's exhausting. <laughs> the client wants something. Sometimes you just say, you know what, if that's what you want, we'll do it. But remember, <laughs> if this comes back and blows up in your face, yeah. You were the one who wanted this to happen. Uh, you're right in that the defense has zero burden. But when the defense starts calling witnesses after the prosecution closes, they don't actually have any burden. But spiritually, to the jury, it looks like, hey, the defense wants to tell us something. Let's yeah. see what's so important. And you call two witnesses, and that's what you get out of them. Now you've left the jury with Robert Costello, when you could have left them with Michael Cohen, who at best, I think, was a mixed bag. Definitely some good things for the prosecution. But there were a couple punches landed. To me, the most significant punch was the revelation that Michael Cohen stole, literally stole money from this guy that the prosecution has painted as sort of having a Svengali hold over Cohen and that all of Cohen's sins were only because he loved and adored and had this undying loyalty to Trump. Not so fast. He actually, Cohen, when the opportunity presented itself, he stole from Trump. That was a point to be made. But the bottom line is you could have left the jury with Cohen's cross-examination, essentially. Now they're left with Costello. It's awkward. It's a little strange. And, but, Tristan, is that even material? I mean, you're, you wrote the 12 rules of prosecuting Donald Trump. 
Is one of the rules that you have to have a pristine witness that's never done anything wrong? Because at the end of the day, Michael Cohen committed crimes for Donald <laughs> Trump. And, I, I, you know, even that part of it that, you know, respectfully, that what Danny yeah. talked about, I'm not sure how that's material. The question at hand, as I understand it, is did they pay off Stormy Daniels? Did, do, did Michael Cohen make that payment himself, committing crimes in the process? Did he expect to be paid back? And was he paid back? And did the Trump organization falsify their business records in order to do that? And was that entire scheme for the purposes of helping his campaign? That right. is what Pecker said is the case. That is what Cohen said is the, ca is the case. That's why they gave Pecker a non-prosecution agreement. I don't see, if, if you want to say, you know, Michael Cohen jaywalked 10 days a week and didn't know how to cross the street without running in front of a bus and, and messing up traffic, so what if I'm a juror? Yeah, I think this is an area where jurors are going to have the common sense that if you're going to catch a criminal or an accused criminal, there might be some other unsavory people or people who did unsavory things that were around that guy. Like, if you're going to get to that inner circle, you're going to find other people that were not doing particularly great things for the guy who's being accused of crimes. But uh, I mean, wait a minute, but wait, I'm sorry, I'm not to correct you, but yeah. not, not doing unsavory things near him or with... For him, it, it's the same crime, Tristan. This oh, is where yeah. I cannot, I can't get no, away from this. Exactly. Is that he went to jail for this crime, not a different crime, a separate crime. He didn't rob Correct. a separate bank. He went to jail for the same thing that Trump is now on trial for. Tristan, make it make sense. I, I'm not a lawyer, but yeah. I can't get away from that just as a normal person. The thing Michael Cohen went to jail for is this, this crime. 